we're looking at moral relativism and specifically the conventionalism as proposed and defended by Gilbert Harmon. Harmon makes an analogy to begin with. He says that motion and other physical aspects of our world are relative. So that means that something that is moving in relation to one thing might be stationary in relation to something else. So this is going to provide a, an intuitive analogy for his view about morality. We're all familiar with this. So for example, a person on a plane. When you are on the ground and you're looking up at the plane flying across the sky, any person on that plane is moving relative to you because the plane is moving. However, if you are a person on the plane and there is someone sitting next to you asleep, well, that individual is not moving. If the flight attendant came by and asked if that person's been moving around, you would say no no motion there. And so whether something is moving or not depends on your framework, your physical framework. We're familiar with how this works with motion and physical aspects of motion. So what Harmon argues is that like motion, whether something is morally good or bad depends on the moral framework under consideration. So just like with motion, there are different physical frameworks that we use to evaluate whether something's moving. With morality, he says, there are different moral frameworks that we use to evaluate whether something's good or bad. Now, moral relativism does not claim that people intend this meaning, meaning when they speak about morality. It's not an analysis of what people intend to be communicating. So he uses phrases like, for the purposes of assigning truth conditions, moral claims are to be understood relativistically, right? according to the particular moral framework in which they are uttered, or according to the particular moral framework in which we are discussing, and it's known that we're discussing this moral framework. Now, predominantly, Harmon is talking about a culture's moral framework. So he's talking about conventionalism. And another way of thinking about this, another analogy that could be used, is to say that moral relativism claims that there is no single true morality. Now, Harmon definitely affirms this. There is no single true morality. That's what it means to be a relativistic. So a conventionalism makes this claim that there's no single morality that is correct. Instead, what we have are many different moral frameworks and none of which is more correct than others. So principles of morality are like principles of etiquette. Just because it might be appropriate in one culture to say, eat rice out of a bowl with your fingers, that doesn't mean it's appropriate in another culture to do that. In another culture, it might be morally, or not morally, following the principles of etiquette to use chopsticks. Or in another culture, you would be following the principles of etiquette when you use a fork. Now, no single culture is any better than any others when it comes to methods of eating rice. There are just different cultures and different frameworks of etiquette. So we wouldn't say that one system of etiquette is superior to another system of etiquette from a culture. Now, it should be clear, and Harmon makes this very clear, that this does not mean that morality should be abandoned. It doesn't mean that morality is meaningless, that he's not a nihilist when it comes to morality. Morality is important within the moral framework that one lives and acts. Another way of thinking about morality is that morality is like rain.
Rain might be good for the farmer, but bad for the golfer. So it's relative to a perspective, whether cultures or individuals. So we might have a situation where somebody wants to go golfing and they want it not to rain. And we have a different situation where there's a farmer who needs the rain for his crops. And so it's very important for that farmer to, to have it rain. So it would be good for it to rain according to the farmer. Now, how do we argue for conventionalism? What is, what is Harmon's argument? Well, first of all, he claims that members of different cultures have different beliefs about what is morally right or wrong. So for example, there are different beliefs and cultures about whether or not it's right or wrong to lie for personal gain. Some cultures have caste systems, some don't. Some have engaged in slavery. Some have different moral status for women that is separate from men and usually below that of, of men. So that's a, just a statement of fact, it seems, that an anthropological fact that members of different cultures have different beliefs about what's morally right or wrong. Harmon then goes on to say, well, moral relativism is the most plausible explanation of this diversity of beliefs. And so when we have those put together, of course, if moral relativism is the most plausible explanation, then that means that moral relativism is correct. So this is an inductive argument, reasoning for the conclusion that moral relativism is preferable, it makes the most sense, out of what we say, out of how we act. Now, the second premise there, the premise that says moral relativism is the most plausible explanation of the diversity, right? That premise is defended because Harmon says he agrees that it requires some defense, but we've already mentioned how he defends this. He uses physical relativism, right? So consider the question whether the earth or the sun moves. Harmon argues that the proper response is a relativistic one. It just depends on your spatio-temporal framework. So you could use a fr framework, physical framework in which one moves but the other doesn't, or a different physical framework in which the other moves. Now, there is some reason to push back on Harmon. So this would be a criticism against the motion analogy. And that is, some are not in a good position to judge. So for example, there is a good question whether the earth or the sun moves. Which one moves? Well, the earth moves around the sun is a better response to that question. Right? We in the 21st century are in a better position to judge which one is motion, in motion than those who lived 500 years ago when they believed that the earth stood still and the sun moved around the earth. We're in a better position to judge because we know more about the solar system and how it works. And that does seem to be the best answer. It's the earth that moves around the sun. Okay. Harmon would deny that most likely, but that seems to make sense. Now, one more consideration on that rain analogy. The rain analogy was about preferences, right? When we said it was good for the farmer, we meant the farmer preferred that it rained, or more to the point, it was to the farmer's advantage if it rained, because his crops needed rain, or the golfer it was her preference that the sun was out, that the, it does not rain. That's what would be to her advantage. The problem is that morality is more than that. It's more than preferences. It's more than just stating what's to one's advantage. Otherwise, why do people disagree so emphatically? It's not, it's not as if people can say, okay, you really want it to do this, and I really want it to do that. When there's a moral disagreement, there's, there's a concern that the other person should take your view. 
and they're doing something wrong if you're viewing it morally wrong. They're, that's how we have moral arguments and, and conversations. And finally, against the etiquette analogy, and this is a kind of criticism of conventionalism that it, we will see developed more when you view the video on objectivism, and it's drawing out implications. So the idea here is if moral truths are relative to a culture, just like principles of etiquette are, then no cultural standards of conduct are better than any other, right? All standards equally as good, no superior culture, none's better than another, uh, so no framework is has priority or preference over another. But here's the problem. Some cultural standards of conduct are better than others. So for example, slavery or treatment of women. Sorry about the unclosed parentheses there. So when we talk about cultures that oppress their women, that prevent them from getting an education or working outside the home or having independence in other ways, we condemn that culture. And a culture that doesn't do those things for, to women is a superior culture. And that seems to be the proper way to view things. And we conclude from that, if both of these premises are true, then moral truths are not relative to a culture. We will see other arguments that draw out the implications of conventionalism and identify problems when we look at the video on objectivism. For now, this gives us a good idea of what might be problematic with affirming conventionalism or relativism of any kind.